Okay, good morning, everybody. Morning. Let's start. The journey is begin now. Don't know when it will end, but it will end. Now we've done um, we've done data processing. We've done KNN. We've done Mary base. We've done decision tree. Today we're going to start with support factor machine. That's what we are going to start with. Um, and did we do discriminant analysis? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Then I'm going to start with support factor. Since I've done discriminant analysis, you remember when I started with discriminant analysis, I was saying that you project the object from the top down. In the case of support factor, you project the data from the plane up. Are you following? It's two opposite. For, for discriminant analysis, you take the object from high level of orientation, or orientation, you put them on the plane so that it's less complicated and it's less computing. But in the case of support factor, you take it from the plane, you project it upward. Do you see that? That means you expect a serious computation when coming to support factor. And having said that, you see that the performance of support factor is always very good compared with any other kind of uh, machine learning you have. That's number one. Number two is that because of the kernel you have in support factor, it has a very strong kernel that can allow a high level of computation and can also reduce the noise in data. When he model, he, he leaves some noise, he creates a kingdom on his own so that he, he, he makes the, 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 the data to be well classified so that it's all the noise, all the noises you see in the case of all other methods, naive base and all those things. You will see the way how support factor navigated and to be able to uh, um, see how what is the performance on um, what do you call it matrices and all those things. We'll look at that. Okay, um, having said that, let's start basically. Uh, what do we have here? Now, when we talk about support factor, we're talking about a kind of a discriminative classifier. A discriminative classifier, which is basically separated by what we call hyperplane. I'm sure Prof. Ajila explained what is hyperplane is to you last time. In other words, a labeled data, when we say a labeled data, we're talking about a data that is a supervised data, that's your labor data. Where you have the variable features and you have a target, then you call that kind of, that's a label, okay? You have a labor data, in other words, you have a target data. That's another name we can call it, apart from classes. We have classes, then we have a target data. Then, when, we, when I use the word, it's the same word I'm saying. Target data in case of neural network is the same as a labor data, okay? Which is your target. And you have your classes. Okay, now let's work with base. Let's look at the two dimensional kind of a variable like we have been working with. In the case of the two dimensional variable, which is in terms of the space y and x axis, that's what we call two dimensional uh, kind of uh, uh, variables. Um, it is divided by what it turns to be the hyperplane. We use the hyperplane to separate them into, into different dimensions. What I'm saying is that if I have a population of data all around, all around, all around, all around. This is variable y and variable x. Now, I want to find a way to classify this data into their group. By visual expression, there's a possibility of two variables or two categories here. X category and dot category. Now, the line that I draw, if I draw a straight line here, for example, you will see there are noises here, there are noises. I couldn't get a good classification there. If I decide to go this direction, let's say, let me put X here, for example. I decide to go this direction. I'm able to separate my x, but there is one noise, which is that noise, isn't it? But this direction, if you look at the number of the noises that I have with this particular hyperplane, 
and this hyperplane, the number of noise, if I go this way, is less. Is it? Because I only have one noise there. Are you with me? Now, if I go this way, there are more noises that are falling in there. Now, this line to demarcate into classification is what in time you call simply to be what is called hyperplane. Are you following me? Now, we said that um, the support factor does two things. It does the classifications and it does uh, uh, what we call prediction. Classification and prediction. It does that, which is time to be a regression. But it does this with the help of what it call kinetric. It uses what it call kinetric to do that. And that is one of the unique techniques that makes support factor extremely useful when it comes to a complex classification. Mary is not here. Mary use this for uh, the language uh, isipedi or something like that. And we got extremely very good result with it. But the language I don't know, but the method I know. But Mary was able to know the method, know the language, and uh, were able to interpret the method with Mary. And I think she, she submitted the paper now for IEEE conference. Now, the kinetic is a key there to transform your data and then based on the transformation it find and what call the optimum boundary in other words you use that kinetic you see when we simulate it how do we use that kinetic to manipulate things around the, the data now simply put it it does some extremely complex data transformation. Now, I'm going to give you a figure now where you look at about three different classifications which we've done. The first one is log logistic regression. The second one is a decision tree. If you look at log logistic regression, which is a linear partitioning, and if you look at this, you look at the decision tree, it's full of patches. And but if you look at support factor, you see the way he applied that connect to meet exactly, he cut out the data and separate all the noises. Like you don't, it does it perfectly. In other words, all the boundaries here were said. If you look at here, there are so many overfitting that is happening here as compared here. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. And that's what determines your confusion matrix where you do it. When you compare, when you apply confusion matrix here and you apply confusion matrix here and apply confusion matrix here. Confusion matrix does not only mean the, the impact of the noise in the data. It also has effect on the boundary that you cover and there is no data. It has impact on it. Now, you could see here, the car, the way it was able to do it because of that connect impact on the support factor. Let's move further, and I'll walk you through different categories. By visual expression, if you look at this data, if I were you or me, we just say, oh, let me draw a line. Oh, straight line, that's really beautiful. That's it, yeah, that's correct. We are right. But, should we move it here? Or should we move it here? Support factor will do it in the way that there will be an equal distance between each factor. Now, why do they call it support factor? They call it support factor because if you have a car and you want to lift a car, you want to change the tire of your car, you put a jack there, isn't it? That point where you lift the car is a pivot point. If you look at this data, there are pivot data. You see, those two pivot data are very important support factor. In other words, they are the jack point. There means that I will draw an iPad plane here. I will draw another iPad plane here. These two line, upper plane, they are the jack where the, the car is supported. Are you following me? This is a maximum 
maximum hyperplane, this is a negative hyperplane, and this is a positive hyperplane. Where you see the support data, that's why they call it support factor. Now, don't look at that data as one entity, one variable. I don't expect to have, I don't expect to call it a, a factor, because it's not a factor, it's a variable. But in actual fact, one of these data points is represented to be a factor entity. Are you following me? But in another case, let's say we have another variable here and another support variable there. That means these two variables, they are where the jack of the car stay. And that's why you call it a support factor. Are you following me now? Now, you see the difference between all other classification we have been doing. None of them was able to find the maximum or the, the negative hyperplane that just say, this is my where I have a categorical data one, variable one. This is my optimum. This is my optimum here. It's separated. There's none of those particular classification that we have. All of them just mix them and have an imaginary line. It doesn't care what distance it is from here, what distance is it from here. What support vector does is that it finds an equidistance between the, the, the maximum hyperplane, which is the average hyperplane, between here and there. This is an equidistance, this is an equidistance. The wider it is, the better will be the classifications. The smaller it is, the poorer possibly the classification of support factor will be. Are you with me? Now, let's look at another case that we have here. Imagine if it is you working manually. If you are working manually, all of us, maybe Dr. Mapai decide, this is where I'm going to draw my line. Dr. Moses said, ah, I'm going to draw my line this way. Pius decide to draw his line that way. Now, which any one of us, which one of us is right? No, we don't know because all of us, we are right. That line separates the two classifiers. There, we can see. But we don't know which of those mixed lines is the optimum. Now, support factor with a connect, it gives you the optimum of that. You will see how it's going to do it. Now, having said that, we see that another case, let's look at this case. The question is, which of these separator is the better, B1 or B2? What will be our debate? Which one is the best? B2. Yeah, that is your official expression. You <laughs> said B2 is your official expression, which is this. But I would say maybe this, possibly. But let's see how it goes by. Because who said B2? Who said B2? Okay, good. You also, ah, okay, I wanted to say that guy come from Nigeria now. I will try. What of you come from? Okay. Now, if I look at it very well, this B2, just watch me. If I decide to find the maximum line, the positive maximum line, my thin line will only go, uh, I have a very, very thin line because of this point. Are you with me? Similarly here, because of this point, I can only project that. Did you see that? Whereas if I go this way, if I go that way, I told you the wider the range, the better the performance. Now, the narrower the range, the poorer, that means I am is wrong, you are wrong. The canal find we find the optimum because it will never compromise this data with this classification. It distinct them. It's like twins. It's difficult to separate twins. They look alike, especially if it's an old. The Chinese name is not there. If it comes from China, you will you will mix them. You won't know A from B if they are twins. 
But the purpose of this is that you'll be able to differentiate between A and B. That's why we say the wider it is, the better it is. Now, this is what we are debating on. You can now see what we are debating on. This shows it's a poor separator. This shows it's a better separator. You can see the margin. The bigger this margin, the better will be the performance of office or port vector. I've given you the summary of the title, each of this margin. We have what we call negative hyperplane, which is a line across the stack. Then we have what we call maximum margin hyperplane. That's the line that separates them into equal distance. That is maximum hyperplane. Then we have these two factors, which where you draw the tangential line to the line is what we call support vector. Those two are called support vector. Where the, the combination of the range between the maximum, the negative hyperplane and the maximum positive and the positive hyperplane is what it turned to be the maximum margin. Do you understand now? That's based on two-dimensional stuff. Okay. Now, I said, still classify because we are debating on which solution A or B will be the right. Still classify with a, a hyperplane by allowing for some misclassification. There will be some constraint on the misclassification. That's correct. It doesn't mean, let me go back, it doesn't mean that you pick up your support factor. Remember, this is a misclassification, but this is an optimum point where you can get your support factor. We still get noise here. That's a noise because the noise is supposed to be in this class down here, not here. But we still find. But if you find the optimum, then that's what we're talking about. Now, there will be some constraint on misclassification. And uh, to do this, you see the advantage of using what we call connect tree. If I have a beast, uh, maybe South Africa might not know what we call bees. I have different variable. You can see how difficult, how difficult for me to classify this, isn't it? On a single plane, if I if I if I used one dimensional plane, can you separate them? It's extremely difficult. You agree with me? One dimensional plane will be difficult. Do you see that? Even if I go to two dimensional plane, if I go to two dimensional plane, let's say I break this here, what I'm going to have is this. I will have that there, 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 and I will have that, and I will have this there. That's two dimensional, it's still clumsy. Mm -hmm. But if I hyperbolic it, for example, I take this now, I draw my hyperbolic line, and I fold this in there. What you will notice is all this will migrate to the top, will migrate to the top, will migrate there, will migrate there, and that will migrate. At the end of the day, you'll be able to see, let's say we map that, you'll be able to see the separator, let's say we do that. We have that, let's say we have another one here, we have another one there, then we have separator. We'll be able to draw a separator line that will be able to separate the two of them under that. Now, let's look at this case. That's the case I've described. Now, if you look at this case, that's the case of two different variables. But when I move, when I fold, look at it, I put them into a parabolic form. Mm -hmm. I fold it. What do you notice? That map up, that map up, that map up, and that map up, that map up, map up, and that goes up. Now, I can create a separator now to classify them. That is what connectric does in the support factor. Do you see that? A complex single plane, a complex single plane cannot classify. Two dimensional plane also find it a little bit difficult until I actualize the graph to a curve feature time. Now, when I do that, I was able to map, do the classification to do that. The engine that does that in a, in a, in a support factor is called connect 
trick, and that's what makes support factor to be unique among all classifiers. Do you see now? Now, okay, now let's move on. If I look at, look at this, for example, we have a case that based on the genetic value of a normal patient and a cancer patient. Okay, we have two of them, which is a function of gene Y and gene X, basically. And we want to use support factor to classify them. Now, what happened there is that we will have our support factor, support factor, then we draw our negative hyperplane, maximum hyperplane will determine the maximum hyperplane. Just to give you more uh, explanations. Then I say the largest gap, which is from here, basically, or what we call margin between the borderline, is what you have your support factor. But if I have a case of a cancer patient this way, we have a normal patient, then we have cancer people in between. How do you do the resolution for them? Now, what happened is that the kinetic will be used to do this. And when the kinetic does that, you put them into three-dimensional plane, then you fold the paper this way. The cancer people stay on the top of the apex, and you have the normal people at the bottom. The movement of these is your decision surface indirectly. And that's what Canel trick will be doing. You will find a way to position the data into the right classification zone. Then you decide. You will see when we begin to play with the simulations now how that Canel normally work with this. Now let's go to simulations. Are you any questions from there? You see, the aim of this course is not to bombard you with equations. When you are writing your paper, you go and take the maths that you've written 10 years ago and dump it there as well. But the simulations, the explanation, the concept, the intuition behind it is what I've given you now. That is understanding of it. The math core, you take it. Yeah. Um, Talk about noise. I just give you, um, let's go back. If you look at this hyperplane, for me to separate this, remember, if it's a perfect hyperplane that I've done, you don't expect this here. You expect them everything of this to be here. Are you with me? But when I want to, this, the, when I want to determine this support factor, I have no other way in this particular classification to position my max to position my positive hyperplane. If I go below this, it will affect this. They will never be equal distance anymore. Are you with me? The best place where I will put it is here. This is where the that's enough. When you do the confusion matrix there, you will see what corrupted is that one. It made it not to be perfect. The way I put the upper plane. And that is what, what I meant by when you determine the upper plane, it doesn't mean that you are not going to have some corrupt noise there. You will have, but it will find the best position to optimize that the support factor for you. Do you get it now? Therefore, it's not that it's going to be void of this. That means you don't, you are going to find a point that you are not going to see this. No, that will be overfitting. This is data is there to stay. But how do we negotiate with it to say, okay, we'll be able to have the best of the best of the best, you know? So you're not sure it's part of the data? It's a part of data, yeah. But it's, it's for, uh, that will fall under the category which is supposed not to be. That's correct. But you still find, normally you don't expect the, the support factor to still find something between the boundary of the maximum margin. You don't expect any corrupt data to be in between two of them. But now I'm not telling you it is possible. So that you don't see it as a strange thing. And you don't begin to delete your data. No. Leave it like that and let it. Once you've done your pre-process very well, whatever that follows, it's fine. Okay, now let's start our read work, which is a simulation. 
Okay, um, like normal, what we normally do, load your MATLAB as usual. Load your MATLAB. And so far, like I told you earlier on, what make this code different is this. Sorry, you see some. If you look at this, under the support vector, it's the same procedure we are following as what we have been following since the first day. As I follow this step, you load your data onto the template. Your normal data, we pick the template like a normal template case, KNN template like what we have been picking before. Are you following? The only modification you are going to have here is your this function. Fit classifier support vector machine. That is the only thing. You are replacing that in the position of K and N the 4. Do you see that? Now, there is another trick here that I think you need to pay attention to. The other one here is that we need to modify your visualization point. In the case of KNN, we didn't modify the visualization. We run the shunt tree on it, perfect. But when it comes to support factor, you need to work on the visualization aspect of it. And having said that, I show you something here that you need to create a unique data because it needs to convert the table to array and table to cell have to happen because it's a support factor. And that is why you are able to see the unique that we introduced here, which you are not going to see in the previous work that we've done. Therefore, those are the two differences from what the template will be using, which we need to modify. Once these two are modified, then we are ready to go. In what I've given you, I've modified already, okay? But you must keep, put it in mind when you want to do it on your own. Let's say you decide to take the template of decision tree. You must go to that three zone. The first one, go to your Go make sure you load your data, go to your modifying classifier, play with it, go to your visualization for training and visualization for testing. You change that to unique so that it make the array to be portable. Okay. Now let's just uh, copy the code like we normally do. Copy your code. Now open your script. Now go and grab your data in your folder. Uh, where's your data now? Here is your data. I've shown you how to do it. Go to property, then go to security, go to whatever extension, that extension, like you have it, copy that extension. And once you copy that extension, Go back to your code, replace this with that extension, read data, replace that, then paste it. The other one is, when you come here, you can see I've changed this for you. Fit SVM, it has been changed, okay? Then, yeah, the other side is visualization, which is now unique. I've done that for you, for the training and for the testing. Those two have been done. Now, once you've done that, we are good to go. Then uh, we just replace that. Then we just wait for the... Off. Yes? I don't see the data. In the folder. Am I right? Do you see under, this? Uh, under, SV, under your SVM folder, there's a, there's a spreadsheet. You found, you found it? You find it? Social network. 
Okay. Now, if you look at this, look at what he has done, and look at the result. You can actually check what is the performance by looking at the result. Just look at the result. You can write down the result if you want to do that so that you can test when we go to modifications so that you can look at the confusion matrix that we have there. Okay. Did you all of you see that? Did you see it? Did you get the result as well? Still coming. Okay. I want you to see something here. I said, note the closeness, the closeness of the linear decision boundary with support factor shows incorrect what prediction. You notice here the purchase. You see the purchase because they are in this line. It shows that default because this is a default result. Shows that. That training, it's, it's incorrect. You don't expect anything on the maximum at a play. They're supposed to separate each order. That's the beauty of it. If you come to the, the, to the test one, we see, still see few falling on that upper plane. Did you see with the few of that? Now, I just want to see the, us, I want us to see the beauty of now when we go to property, to manipulate some property with respect to the canal. What will be the contributions of that? Okay, that's why I show you that one. Now, um, if you can, let, let me just use this. Let's go into, you can, once you are done with that, you can close that and we can open another one so that we can use uh, the property one. I've explained this to you, what uh, those property. Now, let's come here, copy the, the one with property now, and let's play with it. Copy the extension. You are still using the same extension on that import data. Just copy that and just paste it. Okay, once you've done that, then let's go here. Now, this is where I offer you, I need explanation. Now, if you look at this, this is a default one. I've done it for you already. It's a default one. What I've done is that I've had several properties also there. The first one that we're going to look into is to look at the case of the Kanev function. Under the Kanev function, MATLAB has about four or five properties that you can manipulate. The first one is the polynomial type of property. The second one is a linear type. The third one is a Gaussian type. Each of these are the what make the Kanev function to be optimal. Now, I will tell you, when you look at a paper, for example, maybe the person is only using the default one. Okay. And the default one is a linear one. And that is why when you see the graph, you see a line straight down. That's the upper plane was straight. And this is the default one they are using. Are you following me? The modified one are your polynomial and Gaussian one. Are you with me now? Now, 
when you play with the two alone, it's a paper for you, it's the optimum of using a support factor, isn't it? For you alone, because this is a default one. And you compare the result with this, you compare this result with Gaussian. Can you just put that <laughs> Am I too fast? You see, when you grow up eating chili, your mouth will be so quick. Now, by default, you see, we know that support factor use kinetric. They use kinetric to do the classification and prediction. But under the kinetric, if you go to the property in MATLAB, and I've told you, I've shown you how to get more property. I told you you go to the help side and type your V, C, C, V, what? L. It gives you all the property related to support factor. You just go there and copy that and paste it and run it again. Now, in this case, we have a connect function of extension. Now, when you have this, you will see that they are all the same. All these are the same, the same, the same. Now, but what I'm changing now, I want to see the performance of the polynomial. The default one, when we, you remember when we ran the first one to give us that graph, this is, he used this, it's, he used the linear one. Are you with me? Yeah. And that's why you see that graph, it's a straight like all that one we have been doing. But when you want to do the optimum support factor, you have a chance to use the polynomial, you have a chance to use the Gaussian. Then you write another paper. That's what I was trying to tell you. Now, let's, we're going to, let's work with the polynomial now and see what will be the result we are going to get. Okay, now, um, I, I don't think I need to change anything. Okay, let's roll it and see what we get from there. And I want you to pay attention to what result we're going to get. Did you see that? You can see, if you look at this, the modified result, and you compare it with the default one, this is the default one with linear play. This is the modified one. And what you see here, if you carry it out, you will see there's a lot of the less noise is, is being taken care of. Did you see that? And you see the way it draw and give you a, if you carry out a confusion matrix on it, you will see a better result. Let's, let's, let's carry out our test on it. Our test should be result underscore one. Let us see where it is. Just copy this, result underscore one. We, we compare, that's the modified result, okay? Just paste that, and we press that. See what we get? We get the confusion matrix give us 50 and 25, and look at the error. Can you see that? Five. Look at that. That's a very, extremely very good result with support factor. You can see, look at 50 plus 25. That is 75 of the data we use, and the error is only five. And if you compare with the previous one, with the linear one, look at what we have. We are 10 of that, and we are about 70 of that. You see how the performance with the polynomial. Now, I want you to play with the Gaussian now. Don't play with the linear. Linear is the default one, okay? Comment, comment. I want you to comment. Uh, go here. I want you to comment. Let's comment this. I'm going to comment this now. I'll comment this. Go here, comment. Then on comment, on comment the Gaussian. On comment this. I've done it for you. Just on comment alone. On comment. On comment the Gaussian. And that's what you have to do. Okay. Let's try again. You see, just you on comment, you comment. That's all. And you keep writing the paper. You go and get the formula. Go in there, the paper is done. Now, look at what we get with the Gaussian. Look at that. Look at Gaussian. Did you see Gaussian? This is what Gaussian gives you. Look at what polynomial gives you. Look at what Gaussian is giving. Let's look at the performance of the result. 
Look at what we get. And look at the error. Six. That's God shared. You see a better result that we're getting now as compared with what we've gotten before. Now, um, having said that, I hope now you are clear with different method that we've used. Um, who's struggling? It's a Gaussian one, that's brilliant. Okay, that's a good one. Okay. Where's your result? The Gosh that can just that's very upset. Okay. Where's your result, Jeresh? Sorry? All this thing has a mark that Jeresh. This is the handsome of the game. See now, you can use this straight away for your work. It's just one thing to the data, you get the result, and then you do the analysis. Okay, now I'm happy that all of you are, you are able to do this, and it is clear what support factor can do for you. Okay, um, there's a lot of terrible marks at the back of all this. Are you following? But it's left to you, you just take one paper that relates to your own, look at the way they structure the math, bring your math in yourself, do your simulation, get your result, is, and paint your result. You are done. Okay. And I think uh, for support factor, I think I downloaded some papers that can be of a very good help to you. Okay. Yeah, you've seen what we've done, and that is a simulations around a clear simulations around uh, support factor. You know, Um, let me see if uh, these are the research paper that we have in support factor. Let's just walk through it and see what can benefit us. So many research papers that we have in support factor. This one of the research papers short term solar forecasting performance of popular, popular machine. This is the data on support vector machine model for the forecast of photovoltaic power. This is application of support vector machine model for forecasting solar and wind energy resources. This is a short-time solar power prediction using the support vector machine. This is a short-time, this is an electric power generation forecasting method using the support vector. A solar power prediction uses support factor. An offline Yoruba handwritten character recognition system uses support factor. I mean, I'm sure a few people, you won't know Yoruba. Yoruba is my language. Okay. Those people who are working on language, you can see the way they use support factor to determine a handwritten character recognition. See, it's usable. But your is my language, like it's Peggy or Zulu, it's a Zulu. Therefore, you can use support factor to solve the same problem that you see there. Are you following now? Yes. Therefore, can we get the source? It's already your, everything is in the folder you have. So we can declare right now by the Check your doc, check the folder, everything I'm giving you, everything. Where's your work? Eh? Let me see the simulations. I'll check everybody around. Where's your own result? Where's the graph? 
We don't gush here now. We are not going to gush here. Go and do the gush here. Comment, polynomial, and do the gush here. Did you see that? That's for Yoruba offline, Yoruba handwritten. Okay. Like when you are less busy at home, just write the paper yourself. Modeling of daily solar energy system prediction using support factor machine for Omar. Okay, that's for Omar. Omar is a Mkwata. Okay. Then support factor based multi point prediction system of a solar irradiance. Then this another, this is a journal. Let me just see what they do in that journal. Okay. A comparison of time series forecasting using the support factor and artificial network. Yoruba handwritten character recognition using a Freeman chain code and KDRS model classifier. Data mining based filtering to support solar forecasting. Offline depth recognition system for Yoruba numeric counting. In Yoruba, we have but uh, I have they counted. You do that, you capture that, then you use support factor to analyze it so that you machine it so that people know and all those stuff. That's the paper they use to do that. Then uh, this is open source. Standard Yoruba context dependent tone identification. Tone identification. Using what we call a multi class support factor. Therefore, those people who are working on languages, you, you, you can use so many techniques. The same thing people who are working on networking, traffic, and all those stuff, you can model your network traffic. If you go to the internet now, you do for support factor network traffic analysis. You get a lot of paper on that. Okay. I didn't do that for you because I don't have any student working on it. I only took paper where all my students are working. But what you're supposed to do, support factor in network traffic analysis or support factor in whatever you're doing that, uh, you know. Electric load forecasting using the support factor. A short time day ahead solar prediction. Because one of my students is working on it, that's why I was. Uh, you can see what a support factor will be able to do in uh, in solving the problem, any problem you intend to do, and I think that's the summary of support factor and uh, that will be done with uh, the first uh, slide on support factor machine okay i'll give you five minutes break let me stop the recording for support factor i will go on yeah just touch your body did you see any stuff now or your area of expertise. Yes, yes. Support factors. Yes, yes. Yeah, just go and do yourself a favor. All the topics I've covered, go and Google uh, so that uh, we can play with few things there. If you if you open the PowerPoint that I gave you, um, what's that? Okay, I'm going back here. You will see I attach something for you. I say check for these properties. Did you see that? I said check for this property. Open that folder. Those are the property I use just to be able to be able to analyze my results. So that when I write my paper, those are the terminology. Okay, 50%, that, that, that. This is how I, I work around it. Okay, now, when we compute this, for example, I want you to just uh, copy this, 
copy that. It's called classification model dot beta. Then it gave you some parameters. And I told you that anytime you don't understand a certain thing, but you want to explain them, go here, type your V C S V N. You see that? Hmm. It tells you what that particular beta, how to explain it. Because it's where it is find all those parameters. He has given you the value, but you want to use the value to explain in your paper. Now, how do you interpret that? It's going to tell you what that particular value, what do they mean. Okay. Now, the other one we can look into is to look into, let's look at another one. The same thing with alpha. We gave you the alpha, what do they mean? You see that? Just put them in command line. Don't do Tell you what it means. Then it give you all and true. Yeah. Then you know what each of them. You read that yourself in literature or in the manual that uh, is attached to MATLAB. Okay. Also, when you want to check for the bias of the model, you want to check how biased it is. You can also do that and look at the biasness of the model. It gives you around minus zero point that you will see that and also be able to give some quite some explanation there. Then we have something we call box constraint. Or box constraint. It's also what we use to actually do some uh, carry out some classifications also in support factor and you can see give you a lot of result and you can also check it the other one i think i can show you also is to look at what we call the cache information let me just see if it will work uh, it's not in that paper that i gave you I will just check the cache info. from the system point of view. That's your cache info. Give you that is use a key kind of uh, authority to run it. So then yeah. So it's also why is it good to also get more info about the chewing algorithm in terms of interpreting just understanding if you explain to your brain or not exactly. No you you use all this all this stuff when you explain in your paper yeah. so that people understand how your algorithm is behaving how what yeah. system um, spec do you use yeah. in the computation with your algorithm? But those are things that make flavor with your paper, and people understand you have a clear sense of it. Now, let's look at another thing called a con convergence information. We use convergence information in the case of when you talk about the optimization of support factor. A convergence information, whatever you get extra from that will give you the details of what kind of optimization technique do you have to 
support factor. Everything is embedded in the function, but you can't extract them out, but if you use those properties, you'll be able to extract them out. So that when you write, you write with a, a full technical know-how of explanation. Are you on USD? You want something? Yeah. The last part, cache, I want to get the code. Cache information. Yeah. Scope cache. Okay. You, just say, you see, every time, let me show you, every time you want to go in depth into the property of the model you design. It will be that model, remember the model you form is the classification model. That's the name of the model. It can be it can be Pios model. It can be whatever, it can be Pios dot whatever property. Just do the property. One of the property is the cache information. Okay, you just put that model, then you put the property there. Then it tells you details about that property. In that model, do you get it now? Okay, okay let's, let me play with few with you again so that uh, we can see how much uh, but um, let's go here okay let's look at another very important one is this it's called convergence information very very important it gives you summary of what transpired in that particular model. Look at me, look at it, it's gonna give me detail of everything that is happening in my model. Here is it, I've, I've run it, mm. look at it. it. It tells me that it converged at one, the kind of a convergence it used, it used data gradient. When you explain, your model is based on, it converge at one, it used data gradient, then what is the gap? Remember, mm. the gap. that's what he's talking about. That's the gap you see there. It's 1.99 exponential minus 0 0.6. That's the gap. Did you see that? Yes, I am. So can we use this to analyze rain attenuation as well? Or do you have any code to to use to adjust in case you want to get the result to explain the performance of what we're Rain attenuation is a problem and this is solving a problem. This is solving a problem of a data of somebody to purchase a car and not to be able to purchase a car. Remember we are using the age. We use variable class age and we use salary. When we take the two variables together, we are able to predict if this person will be able to buy a car or won't be able to buy a car. Now let's take a rain for example. I want to predict if I have the attenuation, I have the rain data, rain data, I have temperature data, I have humidity data, and, and I have, uh, I want to predict, this is my rain attenuation, I have them, I have 0 0.2, I have 3 point something, I have uh, 5 point something. All I have to do is to classify this that if my rain is greater than 0, 0 0.5, that is a worse attenuation. There is no signal. If my rain is less than 0 0.01, good system state, not affected or whatever, there is signal available. You, you systemic your problem and you machine them. If I have a traffic on my network, when does my network drop the packet? When does he allow packet to flow? If I have a base station here, for example, I want to solve a problem with a base station. A base station have, I have a mask. I have, I have sectorial antenna, sectorial antenna, four antenna facing, and I have a mask of antenna going here. This is a one mobile user. This is another mobile user. This is another mobile user. I have one thousands of these mobile users here. And I want to know if this Vodacom base station, the sector in which these people are, the signal would be sufficient for them to communicate, for example. Yeah. Now, 
if I if this is transmitting minus 3 dBm of signal weight, for example, and everybody here share this, and suddenly I have each of them has let's say they have five bar, let's say on your signal strength, the signal strength is five bar. This guy is having let's say three bar of signal. This one is having two bar, let's say two bar, for example. It shows the signal strength is high here. If I classify that this signal strength very good, good, worse, I can't look at the spectrum of signal strength. That's the data of signal strength are here. And classify that if my signal strength is this worse, there will be a call drop. I can still pick a call, my call is clear. I'm a machine that. I can machine anything. It's ability to take the problem and dissect it, and be able to regroup that problem and use the system to predict it. You see, I just a different field. Okay. If I had, for example, if somebody will have a heart failure, it's a two-state. My heart is good, the heart failure, isn't it? If the sugar level is high and the body pressure is go up, at what threshold the body pressure must go up? At what level the sugar level must go up for somebody to have a heart attack? So, so. Do you get it now? A classifier. Do you, you, you get it? Therefore, you take those data and use them. You see, when we get to the project, I use, I use a, a, a problem with malware. Okay, now, when a virus signature, for example, before a virus signature, you know the way these people build the viruses. They build the viruses on your system sequence. But out of system sequence, if you use a machine learning to learn your system sequence, you know when you run the system, this sequence is perfect. He has learned it, machine learning that. Now, somebody now change the sequence. Remember that the virus attack is a sequence changing. Now, somebody change the sequence. He change maybe a, one of a secretable file or DLL file. Now, he pick up that DLL with extension. I said, this is a strange extension I've never seen before. That's a virus, the machine learning. He used the normal sequence to learn the fake sequence. You will see that problem in the project. I deliberately take a complicated problem to use a machine to explain it and how to solve it. How does a machine predict if a virus hit a system? Do you get it now? Therefore, when we get there, don't push me too much. We, we have a long journey. You have so many questions at the end of the day. <laughs> but I will show you how all these things simply are full. And you see how easy all of them they are. Okay. It's just a matter of just be able to um, classify the problem, process the problem, and segment them and work on them. Okay. Oh, you know, there's this attempt when you read some part after the presentation, you see some people who work on uh, numerical theory to prove the theory that was so that the result is you want to prove it's probably using like what we have been asked for using those files there uh, to prove those numerically. So like now to obtain it, like when you are talking about this attenuation, how do you get the uh, 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 the threshold value to determine which one is good, which one is bad? Like if I want to do this using those uh, mathematical concepts behind this to show that okay. You see a clever researcher the problem of, of anyone who is doing research is not the math. The problem is the computation of the problem. Mm -hmm. Do you get it? Math is ever there 24 hours. The math that I use in my thesis, I don't even understand it up to today. But the way I build up those maths, it's amazing. When you read it, you say, this guy that produced this math, his brain will be breaking. It's a lie. You get it? It's just for me to read a paper, follow the sequence, and use my basic mathematical concept to know that this concept is flowing according to the logic of maths. You know amazing thing in life? No one ever turn, tell a first a newborn baby where the breast is. Have you noticed that? By default, they don't take their mouth. They know, they don't take their mouth to the nipple of the mother. 
there. No one told them. I don't know, maybe God told them from heaven, when you are coming here, that's the way the location of the breast of your mom, you must put your mouth in that. No one tells them that thing. It's a machine learning from heaven, but I don't know. <laughs> but they just pick it up. Once you put them this way, you see their mouth going to this side. You know it's not going down. We say some kind of located. They find it. Yes. You start the implementation and you back it up with the theory and you're able to put those in the medical bag. Okay. And you're paying almost. Let me give you. Okay, Dr. Mapa. I would like to say that uh, before anyone actually goes into any classification, understand the, how you as human will reason about the future. What actually makes this class? First and foremost, don't bother yourself about the mathematics as prophet said. If I want to differentiate between a man and a woman, there are certain features that are peculiar to a man that are not peculiar to a woman. Though they might be outliers from what prof was doing in the classification at that time. There are songs that how this lady resembles a man. That is an outlier. You always have them in the society. So it's from the features, which even in the Excel sheet, you see there are some features the classifiers use to do the classification. There are features and there is an expected result. Once I see this feature, just like a human being, the moment I see this, I see this, I see this in a woman, a human being, I know who this person is. So indirectly, over the years, I have learned some things. That is learning, supervised learning. I am only acting based on what I have learned over time. So it's more of being able to actually look at what are the features that are actually being used to classify situations like this, or circumstances like this, or instances like this. Then, before Prof started actually doing the mathematics and started doing, I think, the foundational part should not be missing. Okay, let me give you the trick. If I want to write math, you see this guy who wrote this paper, might not even understand what this math has. Might not know. Now, this is a trick. You are writing paper on, let's say, um, oh, let me use Mary, because Mary is just coming to the, to the research now. When Mary, when we simulated the land, we used to see Peggy or something like that. She doesn't know what math behind it. Okay, then I told Mary, okay. Mary, why don't you get me 10 papers where they use Arabic with the same support factor, where they use Yoruba with the same support factor, where they use that. Okay, put all of them, 10 of them on the table. Now, show me similarity math here. She was the one ticking them one by one. This is now okay. You see this man? I didn't say. He said yes, but this one did not finish the summation of sigma sigma. That's good. Now take that one. Keep it aside. You learn. But in, okay. Now go home. Extract the theory for me. Now understand the sequence of the first guy. Understand the second one. Now formulate your math from here. And she went home after three weeks. She came with a wonderful, wonderful algorithm. I said you got it. That's it. Pythagoras theorem will never change. It's dead. We will copy him for the rest of our life. Nothing more. You are not going to change that. But the key, the main problem is the simulation part. Once you sim I just want to give you one example. Now, let's say I'm using support factor on renewable energy, PV or wind energy. Are you following me? Look at it now. I'm going to come here, look at what, a least support factor machine model prediction of the next day solar installation of effective PV. Now, I know that. I will look for another paper uh, on that, on renewable energy as well, where they use renewable. Okay, this is another one. And you must try to look at it. Look at the trend of the math. Okay, look at the trend the guy is using. Look at this. Look at this here and get things of them. You'll be able to understand, look at the way it's performing the analysis, the evaluation metric. Look at another one. 
where they use forecast, wind forecast for that. Look at what is using. Did you see similarity? Did you see minimum? Did you see that? Yeah. Did you see that in the previous paper? Mm -hmm. Take your pen and your paper. Follow that. Understand that. Take, read that. Follow the sequence. Take another paper. Follow the sequence. Look at what math and they talking together. Now, from your basic understanding of university mathematics, calculus, everything falls around linear algebra, calculus, statistics, and everything. Now you'll be able to knit them together to follow, to form what you are forming. You know, where your skin comes to see is just one small gap. When I was did my PhD, I was in the toilet very early in the morning. And something came to my mind, they call it cumulative identity. Cumulative identity was not in mathematics at all. It's my own thought. The problem here is that we have, I know we have the probability density. Ah, oh, let me do this. We model probability density this way. And that's why I do probability density, which is a PDF, of any data. The second one is a one called cumulative frequency, which basically goes, which is maximum of one. <laughs> now, my problem was that I want to transpose between PDF to CDF. The data that operates here was operating on the resolutions of one degree resolution. The data that I have was resonating <coughs> on 24 degree resolution. Now, for me to get a good answer, I need to also develop an instrument that will collect, that will collect one degree resolution. I don't have money to do it. Now, I want to map somebody's work who has done it in one degree resolution and make 24 degree resolution to fall on this. Then, I will find the way I will develop a convert a converter to say if I have 24 a parameter in 24 degree, I want to move them to one degree. That is where cumulative identity came from. Now what I did is that when I have this, I took 24 degree data that I have. It form it goes here and as imported and form there. Now, I develop a system to say, if I want to push this graph, extrapolate this graph up here, I want to push it upward. Remember, if I can push it up, this is one degree resolution, this is 24 degree resolution, I've done it. Now, what is the factors that convert it? That is where I develop the theory called cumulative identity. It's my personal theory. The next point is I saw it in Cambridge. Somebody sit down with it as a PhD. It happens in toilet. If somebody tells me what was going on in my mind, it's just nonsense. I didn't even follow it myself. Somebody is doing it now. PhD, and he's writing it to me. I told him that, no, my friend, this was nonsense. I was just playing around something here. Yeah. It doesn't make sense to me either. I just played around. Now, it's not to me. It's called cumulative identity. How do you make a baby to be equal to me and look like me. I scared a baby that I born today to say, I want him to match me. He has all my features. That's what I was doing. It's called cumulative identity. That's my personal theory. And I don't even worry about it anymore because it was done in the toilet. Now, okay, now you can see the math, how to make, how to extract the math out. You take about 10 papers in a similar field, yeah. it might not be exactly what you are dealing with. For example, I'm dealing with solar. I have paper on support factor with all mathematics in solar. But I'm working on language. Now, I will read all the support factor theory algorithm in solar. I will look at the language. What it is, I move the math where they say, uh, okay, now the data 
for me in Sola was 25, 26, 27. But Unjani is 21, the pillar is 27. That I match them. Then I take the theory, I change the theory into Unjani is summation of this letter A, B, C, Z. The match is the same. Do you see how easy it is? That's what we do. Anyway. Okay. Now, I think I've given you what will make you to finish the PhD tomorrow. <laughs> that's the techniques you need to learn as a PhD. And that's the skill. Remember, it's a philosophy. And philosophy is never wrong. You know that? It's a philosophy. Philosophy can never be wrong. That is why nobody fails people with PhD. They only have you to go and do more work. Okay, I can't fail PhD, just go and do more work. If what you are thinking is not in line with the normal thinking, we tell you to go and do more work. Nobody fail PhD. You can't say, I fail PhD. <laughs> you be a stupid person to say, because it's a philosophy. Yeah. If anybody come to there and say, why all of us is working like this every day? What's wrong with you coming from your home? I say you be, hello, everybody, everybody. What's wrong with you? Nothing's wrong with you. You are right. If you can defend it, okay. you use the bag, you change the wall, and use the bag. Hello, good morning, everybody. Good morning, hello. It's a theory, it's a philosophy. But you stick with it, you prove it to people. You prove it and say, okay, the air is blowing too much this direction, the air is supposed to be this direction. And if you come up with the common sense, that's what we call philosophy. You see, the difference between PhD, many times people don't even know, there are three things here you are against, you innovate, you don't support. If you support, that's masters. You cannot do this in PhD. It's a crime. The third one is supposed to be improve. Sorry. Three. Improve against innovate. Once you see somebody say, I support, you downgrade it from PhD to masters. Master is you master somebody's work. You master my work. You, you mimic me. That's masters. PhD, you philosophize around my idea. In other words, you uplift my idea, you rebrand it, you upgrade it, you against it. You must do one out of that. Is it that you against what I've been saying? Is it that you innovate another thing? You can never support me. You are not doing anything. That's that's a master. If you support me, you are following me, like a Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> you see the difference now. Therefore, whatever you want to do as a PhD, you must find when you submit your thesis. Is it that you ask yourself, if I against the pious work, if I upgrade the pious work? Or as far innovate the pious work. If you cannot answer that three yourself, keep the thesis back to yourself. It's nonsense. And you already got a master, we cannot put you back on master anymore. You cannot have two masters. <laughs> now, okay, anyway, those are the back of the package of uh, gist that we said we'll be doing along the way. Let's go back to the work. I'm sure now you got, you got it. You got the way you manipulate things and get out of your problem. Is that clear? Yes. Okay. Now, we see on the property, am I right? Okay, let's just finish this property because they are very crucial. Now, when you look at this, you can see that the data, the data tolerance was given. Everything was, was presented to you. Those are the things that you're going to use. You use all those things to explain in your paper. If you don't have the details, look at it, a data gradient, for example, you don't know what it is. Go to the MATLAB, they will give you the formula for it. Formula for data gradient. You can take that and you will put it. This is my data gradient. 
you explain it, and they give you the value. That is what makes your algorithm. That's when you describe, you explain your algorithm. Those are the tricks that you need. And those are the properties that underlay. Apart from you simulating, these are things that you put into the paper to explain, to make your paper to be scientific. Okay. Well, you said Prof, on metrics you can see the, the what can I say? The formula. The property. Yeah, you can see it. It's there. Every formula they use to build anything is, is there in matter. Okay, let's 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 deal with another thing quickly before I forget everything. Now, if you see, I put a classification gradient, you can also look at it. That gradient is used to compute the support factor. That's the kernel. That's what it used, the biasness, the weight, and all those things. This is what it used. And it generated it for you. Okay. The other point that I want to, you to see is what I call classification model. It's very important. It's support factor. When I was explaining to you, we have the negative line where the data fall. Remember that, isn't it? You remember this? Now, how do you know how many of the factors are support? If I have five here, I have 10. Let's say I have 10 of my support, I have 10 here. How do I know how many support factors do I have? Now, look at how the MATLAB pick it up. Let me show you how it does. You see this command. This command is what does it. If I take this, come here, and point there, and do that. Did you see that? Yes. Now, you see that you see somewhere where you see the zero, you see one, you see zero. Those are basic where you have your support. Zero means the negative part of the point. One means the positive support factor. Those are the data points. Do you get it now? That is how to know the number of the negative hyperplane and the number of a data point for positive hyperplane. You use that command to detect them. And you can use that to explain as well, when you explain in your work. The other thing is that we can also try to play with. I think once I do this here, I'm not going to do that in another slide because I just want you to see the trick around when you are writing paper. How do you play around few parameters? Now, if you look at this parameter, you notice that this parameter is empty because support factor does not use mu or sigma to do its computational um, uh, modeling. You see the sigma is empty, the mu is empty. It doesn't use that, it uses the value. But if you use this now in a decision tree, in a in a, in a decision tree, you use it in KNN, you see we return the value to you because they use the mean, they use sigma, and all those things to do that. Okay, those are the things that uh, we, can, we can look into. Let me show you something that is also not present there. It's called sulfur. It's called, I think it's sulfur. Yeah. Now, if you look at that, you see it return when I use what kind of optimization technique do I use in my support factor? I use what we call sequential card. That's SMO to do that. That's optimization technique that I use. It's called sequential memory optimization or something like that. That is what I use. That means you use that. Now, also, you can test so many things. I think I put a few of them for you to be able to see in your in my attachment, okay? Also, the number of iteration. How many iteration did I use before I converge? For example, how many iteration did I do? This particular operation did about 250 iteration for me. 
It might not be the same in your system, but on my system, is 250 iteration. That means you the iteration. All those things what you use when you explain in your paper. I think let me stop there because I attached the few extensions for you. For you to know more, go to the property, you will see that you get more. But the trick is, I've told you, is that whatever be the name of your model, just take those property and say dot any property. Okay? Dot whatever property you want to put the property extension, it tells you more about that. Apache, all those things, give you all those convergence, give you all those formula. Okay? Give you all those things. Okay. Now, let me stop there. Otherwise, we are still on one. We are still going to a long journey. Okay, let me close this. Let me close that. I think that's hand the support factor side. And I hope you get something there. Uh, let me stop my recording at that point and uh, let's move on to another journey. Now, lecture, we've done lecture six, discriminant analysis, which we did last week. We're going to lecture seven called the assemble. Okay. I wish, uh, I wish uh, Dan is here because Dan is working on assemble. We want to use assemble method to do the language, uh, uh, what do you call it, tokenization on language disambiguation. We want to use that. We want to use the assemble method. Now, when we talk about the assemble method, assemble method is when you combine more than two methods to do prediction. It's what we call assemble. I combine KNN with naive base, that's my assemble. I can combine a support factor with a KNN, it's my assemble. Are you following me? Now, the good thing about the assemble is this. You will do a lot of intelligent data processing. You split your data, you feed them with different machine language to do the process for them. Then you combine them together. Of every time that you do the hybrid of anything anyway, you always get a better performance result. Okay, now let's just see what it actually means, what this uh, sample means. When we talk about the example, an example is a hat of combining a diverse set of a machine learning algorithm. Are you with me? Together to improve, to improve rather, or improve, improve, or what is it? Improve wise. Improve franchising, okay, you know that in the computer. To improve, basically, okay, and as a result of that, it often results to the stability of the model. It will result to the stability of the model when you do that. That is what it turned to be assemble. We said it to improvise, yeah. Assemble is a hack of combining diverse set of machine learning together which are individual model, are you with me, to improvise on the stability and the predictive power of the model. Are you with me? The above example is the way we combine all the predictive together will become to be the example, as opposed to say below this example. Now, when you look at this, there are about two common paths that we normally use in the assemble learning techniques. The first one is what we call bagging. We call it bagging. The second one is boosting. Okay, I've had Dr. Mapai saying other boost and all those stuff, he has used that. But bagging, let me quickly give you the brief knowledge about the bagging. Bagging means that you have the original data. Remember, when we use KNN, we use naive Bay. We pass the original data, a processed data, into the machine. In the case of bagging, you don't do that. What you do with bagging, you split the data into different clusters. Are you following? The same data, you, you, you break them. Now you break those particular data into whatever numbers, okay? Now, you now take different classifiers. Okay, maybe naive base, you use naive base here, you scan it on it, you use that on it. Are you with me? Then we will now give you a new result of a new hybridized classifier. 
That new classifier is what we call a single classifier. Do you get it now? That's what we call a single classifier. It's a nice technique. When Dan said he wanted to use it, I was very happy because I haven't seen anybody use it around me, which is good. Then I encourage him that, okay, go ahead with that PhD in that direction. We see what is going to land us because we can play with so many things. If it doesn't work, we move around, we twist things around because it gives us a lot of chances to do that. And now, the bagging means that bagging tries to implement similar learners on a small sample populations and then take a mean of all the predictions that is your bagging. Okay. Now, in general, in general life, you can use different learner on different populations as well, which means different population, different population, different populations. Okay, now, as you can expect, this helps us to reduce what? What is called variance error. That is the advantage of the bagging techniques. It reduces what is called a variance error. And if you can reduce the variance error in machine learning, you've achieved a lot. Because that's where the issue is. Now, that is the advantage of this. Now, let me just mathematically metric it for you. In a bargain, I have a data that does this. Now, what happened is that I'm going to split this data now. You can see this is my first buggy wrap. Do you see that? It's a similar one. But now, I resample this data. Is this one. Are you with me? I resample it. Then I do bagging on it. When I have set the threshold, these are my threshold. Are you with me? Now, I rebag it again. Give me another one. Now, when I finish all this, I sum them together. I sum the whole weight together. And you will see, when I sum the whole weight together, I will do about 10 rand of bagging or 9 rand of bagging. Then I sum them on this table. When I sum them on this table, the whole sum of the positive and negative give me this. The whole sum of that give me that. Now, the question is that because my two options is purchase or not purchase. My purchase is one, my not purchase is zero or negative one. Are you with me? I sum them up. Now, whenever I see two, remember it's a positive. That is one. Whenever I see minus, that is minus. Then I can say the sign of two is one, minus six is minus one, and all those things. Now I use that variance now to have a true class. A true class will be this, a true class will be one and that. When the negative, then I have that. That is what we call bargain. Simple as it is. But the math behind it, go and check it, you will enjoy it. <laughs> you will enjoy it. But that's what makes your paper to look beautiful. Have you seen my paper? Don't be scared, look at it. <laughs> I was sitting down one day and you spend time with me and you see how do I do those computations, how do I... But once you are trained with it, you will enjoy it. Like my PhD student that, that, that writes so many math, when I train him with it, he's just comfortable with it. He's just playing with it. You might not be able to read it, but you'll find it very, very nice. <laughs> okay, now, I put a summary of bag in there, just for you to read more. Yes? Uh, the bagging example you just showed, it feels to me very close to K-fold. In the sense that we're still using the same uh, algorithm, but what we are doing is we are rebagging the data several times over. If we look at the way K food works as well, it's close to it. You are very right. It close, it's very close to K food. Because what you do with K food is you, you, repeat, you repeat the same data, but you pass it through this only single algorithm. In the case of assembles, you repeat the same data, but you assign different classifier to it. You get it now? You can assign one single classifier, there's no problem there. But the number, you can see. Okay, let me show you here. If you look at this number, where is different is this? 
This is your real number. Are you with me? When you look at the first one, did you see one here? Did you see one here? One is not there. Are you with me? In the case of careful, the real number must be there. But what happened is that the first four, if I go with K equal to one, for example, I have this one. And I use this as my test. That's K equal to one. If I have K equal to two, it's not going to be here. I will, I will train with all this, but I will make this my test. When K is equal to three, I train everything and make this as my test. That's your K food. But in the case of a bargain, no, you are not testing anything. You randomize the number and you can exclude some number from repeating itself because you don't see one here. I can also duplicate numbers. You see now, I duplicate four, but there are some numbers that are not here, inside here. But I pass the classifier on it and I can pass different classifier on it. You get it different, different now. Okay, now. Okay, you read the summary yourself because you know English. Now, let's go to boosting. Let's go to boosting. Now, when we talk about boosting, it's an iterative technique which adjusts, it adjusts the weight as it begins to trade. It will be adjusting based on the past history. It adjusts the weight. It improves. It keeps improving it as it begins to trade. You could see that here, it said, the weight of an observation based on the last classification. You use the last classification to improve the less weight. All like that, that is boosting. If an observation was classified incorrectly, he tried to increase the weight of this observation and vice versa. That's what it does. The boosting in general decreased the bias, not variance error, bias, error because it's using the weight. Do you get it? It's no more, it's no more using the data as a case of boosting. It's using the weight to do that. That is why we talk about the bias, not the variance. Variance, you use variance to deal with your data spread. You use bias error to deal with what? Weight. Okay. Now, however, they may sometimes because they are good ones. You know, we, my wife got a dog, very nice dog at home, and it's one of our favorite dogs now. Everybody look after that dog. Now, she wants to buy another dog. Now she asks me to go back to where we bought that one and buy the female one. Now, but here is my wife's condition. She doesn't want two of them to give back because they said we won't be able to define what that child will result to. It might be a, a super bull, bull, bull dog, which can kill anyone. He said he needs to inject that to two of them so that they don't give back, but he wants them to live together. Because you begin to read paper about if you combine that two breeds together to give back, they are terribly, terribly stuck. The day we don't feed him for one day, he even hits the owner. He won't say this is not pious anymore. He hit the owner. <laughs> and when we bought them, they gave us one. One day they went for holiday. They forgot the person they assigned to feed the dog. They didn't feed the dog for, I think they said for three days or something like that. Wow. And they came back after a week. They actually, they refused to stay in the house until they feed and feed and they gave food. They didn't go inside. They even want the guy not to go anymore but she threw the food to them. Because these are the appetite a draw a dog we use for for things in the olden days. We bought the brief from them. But if you, if you see that dog, he said his leg is bigger than his age. The leg is bigger. When he jump on, when he jump on you and they say it's going to 120 something kg. It's four months, I think four or five months now, it's around 50 something kg. When it falls on you, you know something is falling on you. Now, she wants to buy the female one. And that is where the buyer's weight, you see, is an improved. When you give back to another child, it's an improved classifier. 
dangerous one, a very dangerous one, which we won't be able to define at the end of the day. We think we want to protect the house, but actually we are building the carnival. <laughs> Uh, I think so. <laughs> okay, now, often time, because of the bias error, it results to what we call the overfitting. You will get something like the overfitting. Do you get it now? Therefore, it's because of that improved value that you see there. Now, let's just look at this particular diagram and be able to illustrate it. One of the very popular ones of the type of boosting is what we call other boost. It's called an adaptive boosting. Okay, adaptive boost is an adaptive boosting, basically. And normally, an adaptive boost combines multiple weak learners. Okay, combine multiple weak learners into a single strong learner. Do you get it? That? Now, if you look at this, this is the first learner. Then you move and make it single learner. Then the third stage. It was able to partition it. Now, the last day, which is was four, you can see it was able to perfectly classify them completely. It takes them from the weak and begin to improve. What it was doing, in essence, is that remember, it separate clearly the first one. The second iteration, it was able to separate this clearly. Positive, complete positive in the first iteration. Complete negative in the second equation. In the third, remember when we did this, we still have error, we have error there, isn't it? Now, the third iteration, you look at the first demarcation again, which is the third one. Now, at the end of the day, we was able to perfect it, but we have only one of that. And we was able to partition that, you see? Partition, partition, and partition. You see what other boost does? Now, if anything does this, definitely you expect the overfit, overfitting. Because it's systemic. It's looking for where there is positive completely, where is negative completely. But it started from the positive side. You see, it started from here. After this, you look for where it's going to get another perfect one. When you think so, then you mark this. Next one, you look for where it's going to get the perfect one, then you mark that then he was able to isolate that one. That is what he called had a boost. Is it clear? You see how easy it is? Okay. Now, since you understand it now, I think I can move on. You can read the other thing. There's what he called a gradient boost. Maybe Dr. Mappa can start to use this now because he has used the other way. You can say what he called a gradient boost. And there's another one called XG boost. It's called XG boost. It's another, it's a three common type of boosting that we have. Okay? Had a boost, we have SG boost, and we have the other one. Do you understand the assemble now? Now mm -hmm. let's work, let's now simulate it and play with MATLAB how much it can allow us to play with. Okay, let's go back to our simulations now. You will see what is going to let me just close all this. Close this. Let's open another stuff. Now, um, if you look at it, I think I've added the code is here. Just uh, copy that. Am I coding? Are you sure? I think no. Ah, okay, sorry. Sorry. Okay, now um, let's come here. Do that. Now, what you have to do, like a normal thing we normally do, there is no more space again. Go and import your data. Uh, when, okay, come here, I click, take your property, copy that, and then I like that. Then come here, do that, replace that. And change that. Okay, once you've done that, let's go to most important area. You see, the MATLAB code is here. Is that that is the the, the function is fit 
send a symbol. That's the function. Now, something will strike in your mind. Okay, how am I going to combine KNN with uh, SVM and all those things? You will see the We will see it now very soon. But have you done that? That's the most important aspect. Let me check my note. The other one is your visualization. It's also unique visualization, as I've told you. The two of them, visualization test and visualization training, they are two. Okay, they are unique ones. Now let's just uh, roll it and let's compute it. Okay, let's roll it. Oh, brilliant. It's now computing. Okay, are you doing your own? Say. I'm hearing back on. Good. Now, did you notice something with this when we when we achieved it? Look at the graph is giving on the same data. What do you do? Do you remember I told you about the assembly with overfitting? You know it's looking for the part, it's a, it's a perfectionist. Look at what it's doing. You see all those red patches that it throw all around? It's overfitting. Because that's what it's trying to do. You also have. Now, did you notice that this is overfitting? You see, it's trying to find the best, the best cough. And when, in the case of all other ones, they don't do this. It's a perfectionist. You see, so he's a big perfectionist. Just doesn't want any data to escape. We want to make sure that he classify that data no matter what. Because that's the power of example. And that's why I was very happy when Dan said he want to use it, example. So that we are able to do something with it. Okay, let's let's play with few property. Let's play with few property around it, and I think uh, we'll be able to get more. Now let's do let's um, close this, close that. Let's open another notepad, another um, point, then go back to your extension here. Do I attach it? Oh, I don't think you have it. Okay, go to your folder. Go to your folder. You see the assemble classifier with option. Did you see that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Take that and just drop it on your MATLAB. I'll just take this and drop it on the MATLAB. Okay, drop it there. Okay, now change your extension, your reading data. Uh, where is it? Oh. I just copy this. Okay, I'll paste that. Now I'm going to offer some explanation here now. If you come here, look at the property he has. <coughs> the first property is a default property. You see this property? It's a default property. Are you with me? Now, I want to look at it. You see, the number of lady cycle is another property. Here, you must be careful. If you set by default, the lady property is 100. You will leave your computer here. You come back following day. Therefore, make sure this is no more than five. Don't ever make mistake to put this in. By default, it's hundred. Therefore, let it be five. Reduce it to five. It will be five. That's why I quickly put it for you. You must be careful. Then you simulate it. Okay? If you simulate it, let's see what we get. 
One thing I didn't do earlier on is that we did not test the result, the confusion matrix. But you can test it, you'll see the confusion matrix is perfect, almost perfect with confusion matrix. Okay, I'm now competing with five now. Just imagine with five, see how slow it is. Now, if you compute with 100, which is a default, you see, if you don't number it, it will be a big problem. You can test for confusion matrix, okay? You don't type result underscore one, and you check it, then you see what confusion matrix is going to give you, how better it performs. That's what you get. <coughs> okay, now, I want you to now, when you finish this, I want you to comment, comment this line. I want you to comment this line. Comment it. And uncomment this line. Uncomment the next one so that we can see when we decide to use KNN. I want to use KNN now. Are you with me? I'm going to compute it again. Now I'm using KNN now, Lena, with the number of cycles. Good. Yeah, I think this, I, I expect this. There is an issue that I need to. Things that uh, I wanted to happen, which I remember I didn't really tell you with KNN. Uh, there is one that has a clause that you cannot use with the data with either categorical data. I think you use KNN under this assemble. That there is one that you cannot use with numeric data, you have to use it with categorical data. I think it's KNN, that's why I think that. Sorry? In front of what? New? Oh, okay, yeah. Okay. Okay, that's okay. Because you cannot use, another thing that you must bear in mind that you cannot use all this for either categorical data or numeric data. You must know which one will be appropriate, okay? You see how long it takes to compute now? See what it gives. You try to do for, you see how poor it is? Now, let's comment. The last one, this discriminant is also the same, but what I want to do now, comment this line for me. Comment this line again. Now go to, go to the last line. This is where you do multiple assemble. Okay, if you look at this line, look at this line. On comment, look at this line. You see, you have um, if you look at that line, you have the normal thing, you have your learner. Now, immediately you want to use a multiple type of model or classifier. Here is the tree, and you see that I'm combining decision tree and I'm using combining it with discriminant analysis. I'm using two now. Two type of model I'm combining now. The decision tree and discriminant analysis. You can have three, you can combine three, you can have decision tree, the learning, uh, decision tree, discriminant analysis, you can also add your KNN. You can also add support factor. Are you following? Now, but uh, you must uh, be able, now when you do this, it's a three, it's two assemble method. Okay, let's do it. I think you might enjoy it a bit, so that if, if there's error now, I'll be able to pick it up. Okay, it's computing, look at that. Computing now, okay. No. Commenting and now, uh, sorry, is I'm it? Saying you, you, you uncommented the. Now I'm using the last one now. Yes. I'm uncommenting this. Where I combine decision tree with discriminant analysis. You can also change it to naive base. 
Okay, you can have decision tree and you have a knife base, then you combine the two together to do the classifications. Okay, you can use board. Okay? Yeah, it's giving error. What is it? Same. Eh? Well, what am I? Where is that? This one. So why am I making that mistake? I was doing everything here some night ago. Okay, let's see. I think now you see how easy the life is. Okay, you just manipulate so many things on your own and uh, see what you get. You can now check the property, check the, the, the mattresses and all those stuff. How do we then avoid overfitting? Eh? How then do we avoid overfitting? You see, one of the things with overfitting is um, it's difficult to avoid it. You then that tells you which kind of appropriate model when you test it you should use. Okay. Then overfitting, especially when it comes to publication, is in your favor. But when it comes to implementation, it's not. Because you are not realistic. But when it comes to publication, because when you check the confusion matrix for overfitting, it's reduced. It's perfect compared with other work. But it's in favor of you for publication, it's not in favor of you for implementation. Okay, now, did you are you find out with that? You've seen how it works. Okay? Now, um, You see, I put one comment there, which I think you must pay attention to. I said by default, this is 100. And that will take time. Overfitting problems and complex decisions boundary. That will be disadvantage if you increase this. Now, if you don't know, when I read paper of people, people will increase this and get the best official <coughs> matters. Now, you will be chasing the guy because the guy is unrealistic. In actual fact, but it's making a complex decision boundary to happen. This is a problem. You need to explain to me how you address this. This is what you look for in paper when you read that kind of thing because the confusion matrix is perfect, but this is what it did. It shoot this one to 50 or 100. It just leave the computer for three days. Then it come back and got good result. Then it performed the confusion matrix was zero zero on the negative side and the positive and it got hundred percent then you'll be chasing that you are chasing the shadow it's not realistic do you get it now now the other thing that you must know is that to change more classifier three classifiers are available in MATLAB I need to let you know there are only three in the current 2019 they only have three classifier after that three classifier there is no more classifier for you up to 2019. Maybe in the next cycle, you would have improved on this. But you have the advantage for the classifier. And I put something there to increase the number of classifier use the template, which we use. That's the template. If you want to if you want to catenate the number of classifier, you use template. You cannot use KNN and decision. I think I should paint this in red. You cannot use KNN and decision tree to get that. Don't ever use that. The MATLAB is going to tell you it's impossible to get. That's why I put that small note for you. So that when you read it, because you might be trying to do a lot of hybrid, now, then you have a problem. Okay. Okay. You see how easy assemble method is? Tell them that assemble is easy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so many, uh, it creates a lot of uh, uh, overfitting. Yeah, but never mind. Remember, it is to publish your paper, you defend that yourself. <laughs> okay, now, let me also allow you now to stretch your leg again. Uh, I think we are doing well overall. Yes. You have been a very wonderful student. Thank you, sir. Stretch your leg for another five minutes, then we continue the journey of our life. We're done with assemble. Now we are going to something very interesting, evaluations. 
Evaluations. Your special leg for five minutes. 